Father, that song's powerful, Psalm 50, 42, where there are times when we are, we're desperate. We're drowning. And uh, we need to know that, God, you have us and you sustain us. I, th I just think of the Petersons with that song. It's, it's going to be a tough time for them, really tough time. I just pray you would show yourself strong. Again, we thank you, God, for this hour that we have to worship you. I pray as we open up your word, it would be clear. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Excuse me, I do have my drink up here with me. Any of you going through like a little bit of a cold lately? It's been passing around. It's not been too good. So every once in a while, I might have a coughing fit where I fall on the ground. But it's all right. I have my cup. Jared gave me a good remedy. White lightning in lemon juice. It's great. I'm kidding. You know what it is? It's green tea with a little bit of Halls melted in there. So it really will help me. As a pastor, there is, I would say, on a regular basis, there is one question, one simple little question asked in one simple little word that is one of the hardest questions to answer. And a pastor has asked it often if not every week, every other week at least. And the question is this, why? Why? I lost somebody that was not that old. Why? My spouse left me. Pastor, do you know why? Why, why does this happen? I have cancer. Why is there so much violence, rape, murder? Why? Why is it so hard sometimes to even keep a mortgage? Why bankruptcy? Why? Why, why will a seven-year-old boy die with a brain tumor or a five-year-old be drowned in his backyard pool? Why? You can even ask it in your own life. Why is life, for most of us, hard, so hard? Why does it seem unfair? Often this question, this question is, scare, uh, is squarely aimed, when it's asked, it's aimed at the character of God. If he is good, the saying goes, if he's good and he's all powerful, he should step in and do something, right? So, if he didn't step in and do something, does that mean he's not all good or does that mean he's not all powerful? This is known as a theological discussion called theodicy. Theodicy is how pastors, theologians, Bible scholars, they try to vindicate divine goodness or even providence in the light of evil. If God is good, why is there evil? Often this question is posed, how it is on the top there. It's a, actually, it's a best-selling book that came out about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, by a rabbi. And the question is, why do bad things happen to good people? This question has vexed and perplexed people for centuries. This is a very difficult question. The author, Rabbi Kushner, essentially argues this. Bad things happen because they just do. That's his argument. They just do. Life happens. To find answers, often it's just not worth it because, in a sense, ultimately God is powerless to do anything. There's no grand design. There's no answer, really, for pain. That's what, how his book answers it. Actually, have you guys, last week, did you read the Grand Rapids Press front page? Actually, Caleb, do you know what this is, a newspaper? Have you ever seen one of these things? Front page. Gathering without God. There's an assembly in Grand Rapids called a Sunday Assembly. And it says they are a group that brings together those who are outside religion's circle. They, they quote, We like to say we ripped off the best stuff of church, but we do it without the religious dogma. In other words, they do church, but they leave out God. Let's do church. Ah, forget about God. 
It says at the monthly meetings, there's a welcome, a lecture that can relate to life's moments that are good or bad, and music that speaks to the soul. And then they say we offer best wishes for healing. Best wishes. Goes on to say uh, there's no hymns, there's no prayers, there's no doctrine. Mike Whitmer, who's a local theologian uh, at the seminary, asks, um, what do they believe in? <laughs> what do they believe in? Why do they meet? He goes on to ask, without belief in God, what's the point of even meeting? Well, the writer says there are some, some of the most moral, highly intellectual people I've ever met. They just happen to believe in something different and not have a deity or book to tell them what to do. And one writer, one person at this assembly said, I saw joy in people's faces. I saw people you didn't know hugging. I saw people having fun and making family. You know what? They've been doing that for about 4,000 years. You know what they call it? A bar a pub, and they sing better songs probably than what they sing. I know, I've been there. I just, I'm telling you. But this is not the biblical account of suffering and evil. If you don't have God and you face horrible situations, it can be devastating. What do you do? Where do you turn? Today we're going to jump into that. We're going to jump into this mystery and find that for Christians, bad things do happen. I'm not going to say to good people because Jesus would say, what, what, do you call, what is good? Bad things do happen. But they are to prepare people for God things. It's funny, when I was writing this up, I was thinking about what should the title be? Bad things do happen to good people. And then I wrote, maybe to prepare people Prepare those he loves for good things. And when I wrote it, I wrote it on my iPad, and it spell-checked it. It didn't put good in there. It put God in there. And I'm like, that's exactly it. Why do bad things happen? To prepare those who he loves for God things. So today, I'm not going to offer an apologetic defense. That means I'm not going to try to explain why evil happens. Try to explain why God has apparently a lack of concern when everything falls on me. That's not going to be the issue. The issue is, this is going to be a guide to understanding God's most often used tool to wake us up and to put us into his plan. It's through often, it's through despair, which leads to depression, which leads to desperation, which leads us to run to God, and that leads us to finding wonder. And where I get this from, it's from the first story in the book of Luke. If you turn to Luke chapter 1, it's the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. The stage is being set in the book of Luke for the arrival of the Savior of the world. The one who, we just sang it, the one who comes into darkness, light of the world who comes into darkness. So in a sense, Zechariah and Elizabeth's story is a encapsule form, the story of Israel. And in smaller form, it's your story, my story of redemption. There's a strange belief that unless everyone is happy, God has not done his job properly. But that's not why God has come. God wants you to grow in character, not comfort. And that's what Zechariah and Elizabeth's story is all about. Let's read it, verses 5 through 25 of chapter 1. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest. His name was Zechariah. He was of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So she also was from a priestly family. That's what that means. It's to heighten their devotion. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, 
and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Listen to this next, next word. I love this. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah said to the angel, how, how shall I know this? For I, I'm old, I'm an old man. My wife's advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. This is the passage we're going to look at. Pretty simple. It begins in verse 5 and 6 with this couple that is righteous. They are a righteous couple. Not only are they priests, that they dedicated their lives to God. Elizabeth is the daughter of a priest, and she married a priest. She probably is one of those ladies that said, I hope I never marry a pastor. She's too bad. She married Zechariah, and they were dedicated to God. They wanted to please him. It says they were blameless when it came to the commandments. They were really good people. If you want to say religiously good, they were good people. However, according to verse 7, they had, listen to how it reads, they had no child. Now, to Jewish people, a child was a sign of blessing. Here, these people are old. They've been dedicated to God for a long time, and they have... No child. Not only that, but she's barren, physically unable to have a child. Not only that, but then it describes them as advanced in years, meaning it's hopeless. They do all this good. They do all this good. And they get nothing back in return from God. That's the epitome of hopelessness and a silent God. This storyline should sound familiar. Doesn't it sound familiar? If you know anything about the Old Testament, this is Abraham and Sarah's story. Almost identical. The father of the Jewish people. Abraham and Sarah were old. A hundred years old. Sarah couldn't conceive. The angel came and told him, 
you're going to have a child. He believed, and it said he was accounted as righteousness for him. And Sarah had a baby. This is the story of Hannah, same story. Hannah was this lady that was married to this guy named Elkanah. Elkanah had another wife. She could have all kind of babies, but Hannah was barren. It actually says God closed her womb. So she cried out, cried out, cried out. She gave birth to a boy named Samuel, the first prophet. It's a familiar story. I would even say this is most people's story. I call it the story of desperation that's written in Psalm 73. Take a look at Psalm 73. I think it's a story of desperation because, and I think this is a very familiar story because I believe that's the point of salvation. It enters in when I need deliverance, and if I'm not desperate, I don't need it. And Jesus is a Savior. Listen to how Psalm 73 is written. It's a Psalm of Asaph, verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So he's saying, you be pure in heart and God will be good. But for me... Man, my feet have almost stumbled. My steps have nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So if you be good to God, he'll, especially if you're pure in heart, God will be good to you. But not me. I've been good. Nothing, nothing happens good for me. Seems like the arrogant, they prosper. Verse 4, they have no problem until they die. Their bodies are fat and sleek. That means they're pretty rich. They aren't in trouble as others are. Not stricken like the rest of mankind, therefore prides their necklace, violence covers them as a garment, their eyes swell out through fatness, their hearts overflow with follies. Meaning, people who don't follow God, everything goes good for them, but not me. That's why in verse 13, the writer, the psalmist, is desperate. He's upset. And he writes, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. The NIV says, Surely in vain. Have I kept myself pure? In other words, <laughs> why live for God when those who don't always win? At least they seem to. And then you have verse 14 and 15. For all the day long, I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. All day long, I've been plagued. That's what the NIV says. I've been punished. You could put it like this, I feel like I've been dealing with this for years. There's no end in sight. So not only am I trying to live for God, but I've been doing it for years. It seems like everybody who doesn't wins, and I don't. I know you feel this way. I do. Well, I graduated high school. My three best friends in high school, my three best friends, right now, my one friend owns a $6 million house in Shaker Heights, Ohio. It's doing really well. My second best friend in high school, he's on a sailing team because he has about a 40-foot yacht in Chicago. He's doing really good. My third best friend, who I played years of basketball with, this guy, this guy, he's doing great. These are the guys I used to sit in the cafeteria with and, you know, shoot quarters where we'd play quarter basketball during the cafeteria, and now these guys... I look at them, I say, what in the world? My wife, her mom, you probably heard this, but there is many times. She said, my mom is a servant. She just wants to serve people. She can't even stand. You have some of this. I know you do. Some of your health just, just doesn't seem fair. Some of you have lost somebody you love. doesn't seem fair. If you go back to Zechariah and Elizabeth's story, even in verse 25, she hints that her whole life she was a reproach among her people. That means here's this blameless couple, and they carried disfavor in their community for years and years. Personally, I think there is... When Elizabeth couldn't conceive, 
I think there is a deep sorrow for people that can't have children. I think it's really deep. Like you're missing out on a joy that other people can have. There's a depth to it that I don't think we can understand when we haven't been there. Then they see people who get pregnant out of wedlock, and it's even another knife. I'm doing it right. But it is here at that despair the moment at our lowest, when we are in the throes of desperation, that I believe God finally has us where he wants us. He finally has us in our undivided attention. Here's what desperation does. Desperation wakes me up to my need. Desperation exposes the vanity or the emptiness of riches, power, and position to meet my need. And desperation forces me to throw myself fully on God. That's why he brings us to that point, because it clears away all the dust, all the idols, and he's the only one I have left. I once had a teacher that said, I believe those who God really loves, actually A.W. Tozer said the same thing, but those who God really loves, he hurts the most. It's, and I was thinking of this. I was reading this article that said, when you go to countries that are really the poorest, atheism is rare. It thrives in countries that are rich. Like a Sunday assembly. Could you imagine having a Sunday assembly in a place that just got ravaged by war? Hey, let's all meet together and share nice stories. Why? Why? Well, in Zechariah's story, this is where it gets exciting. Let's go back to Zechariah, I mean to Luke 1. In the moment of his sorrow, the way it's written, if you have verses 5 through 7, it's pretty dark. Verse 8 it says, Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, what you have to understand, his tribe of priesthood, they would, say, they would serve in the temple, in the temple in Jerusalem, two weeks out of the year. They'd do rotations. And then it says, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So what they did is out of his tribe, they would cast a lot to see who got to go into the Holy of Holies, beyond the veil, to burn incense. It was an amazing honor. One writer said this would be the dream your lifetime dream. Because not everybody ever got to go into Holy of Holies. You give your life to it, and then your name gets chosen by a lot. I get to go in there. It's my one chance. One chance. As you can see, this is, he got chosen by a lot. It wasn't coincidence. God's leading. This is a God thing. So it says, and he went in there, to burn incense, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. What does incense illustrate? It illustrates prayers that go up before God. The sweet smell, and that's what prayers are like. We offer them up to God. So here's Zechariah. He goes into the Holy of Holies sanctuary, a place separate. People outside are praying, but he's inside alone with God. Symbol of prayer Jesus puts it like this in Matthew 6, 5, and 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received, they've received their reward. So those who do it to get the show, they, they got what they, they wanted. Then Jesus says, but when you pray, Go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, it ends by saying, your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. So to me, prayer is like this. That little white box represents this sanctuary, this place that's set apart, that's alone. It's that secret place Jesus said. And outside is darkness, is the world around you. 
Psalm, th- Psalm 73, the writer puts it like this. He says how, when, I, when it was hard to understand how the wicked seemed to prosper, and then verse 17 says, I couldn't understand it until, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until I went in, then I understood it. To me, it's like this. When I enter in the sanctuary, I literally meet with God. And when I meet with God, his truth, according to Psalm 43, his truth and light enter. I I taste the presence of the Lord. He enters into my life and my situation. That's why Jesus said, when you go in secret, he will reward you. The reward is his presence. If you... I put this in my blog, but the best, I was thinking of what, how could I illustrate this? And the best illustration of what I think a sanctuary is, a prayer, prayer closet, is when I went scuba diving. It's the best illustration I can think of. I took scuba class, and I can remember our very first dive, we had to dive 150 feet down. It was in November, it was cold. We had scuba gear on, we had tanks on, we had this BC, a buoyancy compensator, and we had a weight belt on. And we were going to go about 150 feet deep. Every, most people were scared. There was about six of us that decided to go. And the reason why they didn't want to go was pitch black in ice cold water. And so I can remember diving in. And I dove in, and I start sinking. You start sinking, and the farther you go, the color changes from like a like a dark green teal down to a dark gray, down to a charcoal gray. And then you get to this point about 40 feet down where you can put your hand right there. You can't see anything. Now, if I didn't have what's called a regulator, that's where you have that device. You put it in there and you breathe in and out. You sound like Darth Vader. If I didn't have that, I would within... A minute die. I'd be in pitch black death. You can even set your compensator where you just float. So when you breathe in, you go up a little bit. When you breathe out, you go down a little bit. But you don't go anywhere. You just sit there. And I can remember just floating there. But when you put that regulator in, you start breathing air that has been captured above water. That air is from another place. It's not down here. But it's what allows me to survive down here in the dark. The prayer closet is the same thing. It's my world closes in on me. I'm desperate. I feel like everybody's winning. All the people don't love God. Everything goes right, but not me until I enter in the presence of the God And then I I tell God I need him and enters his life and light. His presence, his heavenly oxygen enters my life. That's what prayer is. Jesus said, go to your secret place, be silent. God will see you and he'll reward you. The reward is his presence and power to enter into your life. And that, to me, is when wonder comes in. That's when wonder breaks in. God's life's wonderful. And when it breaks in, you, you just can't believe it. And to me, when, it, when God breaks in, his truth is always stranger than fiction. It just doesn't make sense. It won't make sense. But life will be di- completely different. Watch what happens to Zechariah in the story. It's hilarious. So he goes in, he offers incense, and then he gets to verse 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord. I don't know what that would be like looking at, but an angel of the Lord. Some angels... Like, I can remember the story, one of the stories that freaked me out is the story of David, when David went up to, uh, he was in Jerusalem, and an angel of the Lord was going to kill him. He just got done killing 70,000 people in a city, and all of a sudden, God let David's eyes open up to this angel that just got done killing 70,000 people. That's powerful. That's why it says, 
And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled, probably a little bit. And it says fear fell upon him. Angels are devastating. They're terrifying. They're not Valentine's angels that are chubby with diapers. These are beings of power. And there he is at the right side of the altar. And then he opens his mouth and listen to what he says. The angel said, do not be afraid. And I, I read this earlier, but this is so beautiful. If you were there last night, we had a prayer meeting last night. Take this to heart. Do not be afraid, Zachariah, or whoever is praying last night. Your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. If you read the book of Daniel, when Daniel prayed, the angel finally came down. The angel said, the moment you prayed, I was sent. I just had to fight through some demons to get to you. Read this book that said, every time you pray, it's like God instantly sends a snowflake down from the sky. The more prayers, the more flakes. And then he asked the question, would you like a snowstorm? Keep praying. It says, do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And we're going to talk about John in a couple weeks. He's a pretty important guy. Now watch all of the ands. It keeps getting better. Watch all of the ands. And you will have joy and gladness, and many, many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, that means he's going to be set apart, Nazarite. And, let's see where I, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So this guy's going to bring a lot of people back to God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the Father to the children, and disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So he's saying, Zechariah, not only has your prayer been heard about you want a child, but the answer is abundantly above anything you can ask for, hope, or think. Does that remind you of a verse? Ephesians 3.20, go to there for a second. This is an amazing a little, it's a little thing to do on the, when you have nothing else to do. Ephesians 3.20. It says, now to him, to God, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that's working. How much, how much can you ask for? I mean, really, how much can you ask for? Well, I can ask for a lot. No, how much can you ask for? Just think about it. Just sit down. And then it says, I know you probably won't want to verbalize it, so how much can you think about? I can think about an incredible thing, like really incredible thing. I can think about incredible thing. God is actually calling you out to do that because he's saying, I can do more. It reminds me of Dave Harrison's mom's funeral. She, Elsie Harrison, she'd often have discussions with her granddaughters, and her granddaughters would say, I love you, Grandma. She goes, no, I love you more. No, I love you, Grandma. No, I love you more. I love you, Grandma. And then every time they'd leave, she goes, you have to remember, I will always love you more. Whatever you can ask for, hope, or think, he can always. Do more. That's the wonder of prayer. To experience wonder, I think I find two things at play. That means by wonder is to really let his life affect yours. I, I find two things from this and just in my own life and from Scripture. The first is this is God's promises. His promises never depend on me 
and often he will do it in spite of me, and sometimes to spite me. Watch, watch this conversation with Zechariah and the angel. So Zechariah, he's a priest, and he gets to serve in a temple. So you know he's probably pretty respected, pretty smart dude. He's blameless in the law, so he's really an upstanding citizen. So he really has it together with God. So when the angel comes and says, your wife Elizabeth is going to bear a child, he's, I don't, he don't believe it because he's not seen it. And he's a, look what he says, verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, how, and watch how many times it's a personal focus. How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. See, I don't see it happening, and because I don't see it happening, it ain't going to happen. You know, I know, I've been around a long time. I've seen God do things, and I just don't see this one because I'm, I'm old. I'm Zach. I don't, I don't see it happening. And now listen to how the angel addresses them. And you have to let this angel address you the same way. He says, first of all, okay, you're Zechariah. I'm Gabriel. <laughs> Do you know who Gabriel is? He's one of the archangels. He's been in the book of Daniel. He's something else. He's God's head messenger angel. Okay, Zach, I'm Gabriel. Not only that, I stand in the presence of God. I see God. And not only that, I was sent by him to speak to you and bring you this good news. God's promises never depend on us, ever. This is so important because your prayers don't depend on you fulfilling them or figuring them out. I think the reason we don't pray is because we can't figure it out. I don't know, I don't know how God will ever do this, and since I don't know how God will ever do this, I won't pray this. It doesn't depend on you. It's, it's funny because you have, it's when people say, ah, I don't believe in God, and they are, when they say, I don't believe in God, they cross their arms, and they almost think because they don't believe in God, he doesn't exist, but he exists. And when he gives a promise, listen to verse 20. Verse 20, he says, and behold, it will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will... Be fulfilled in time. Don't worry. God will do it. Second thing I would say is God's promises rarely follow the patterns of culture. Verse 25. In these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden. There's a lot of question. Why did she keep herself hidden? Gives a little bit of a hint in verse 26. The Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away the reproach among my people. It's almost like for the first five months, you don't show that much. After the five months, there's no denying she's telling the truth because people won't buy it. God never answers the way people assume he will. So just some principles to consider. God's promises rarely follow. The patterns of culture, his ways are not our ways. Truthfully, I really shouldn't be a pastor because I didn't go about it the right way. I kind of fell into it. And so when all of a sudden God opened my heart and I said, I think God's calling me, my friends are like, you're crazy. You're crazy. Here's just a question I think we have to ask. Am I a fool to hope that God will answer it? You know, it's funny, we were talking in the men's... Um, prayer room and we were talking about Christian movies and one person said the problem with Christian movies they always end well as if we should be foolish to think they will end well life shouldn't end well it never does doesn't it am I a fool to hope God will answer prayer even big prayer I know Zechariah and Elizabeth were praying a long time a long time but here's how I look at God I look at God like an artist looks at a canvas. A canvas, if you go to a canvas to draw on a canvas, a canvas is white. It's all white. To make a picture on that canvas, you use dark strokes or other strokes. Those strokes help bring out the picture, but the canvas for the most part is white. To me, this is an illustration of life. 
The canvas represents the way God has designed. God wants to bless us. He didn't make us to make us have a miserable life. He made us because he wants us to enjoy him forever. So the canvas, the background, is joy. He really wants you to have joy. The black strokes are what helps bring out the picture. They make your life fuller. First Peter puts it like this. You're going to have trials and tribulations for a season to make your faith tested to see if it's true and pure and right. But it's a season. It's not life. Psalm 30 says this. Go ahead and click it. His anger is but for a moment. His favor, which is the white backdrop, lasts a long time. Actually, that's what eternity is. is Pleasure's at his right hand forevermore. He's dealing with sin, and to deal with sin, he's got to he's got to get it out of us, which is pain, suffering, but the result of that, faith, which leads to his joy. How do we practically apply this? I was thinking through it. And here's what I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you on two things. Hold up your right hand and hold it kind of like this, like you have something in there. Now imagine it's something heavy and weighty. It can barely hold it up. That is a mountain that has been in your path for years. That is bringing untold trials and turmoils to you. That you can't, you can't see a way through. This is what you have to pray about when you're in your prayer closet. To, for God to move that mountain. Now go to your left hand. Your left hand is... Your longings, what you want. L stands left, longings, what you want. Which God wants to give abundantly above anything you can ask, hope, or think. Now here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to start praying about these two things. When you're in your car, maybe your car is your sanctuary. Get a place where you pray about these two things. And when you see God start to answer it, I'd love to hear those things. I would love to hear about them. I would love to start sharing that. But just start. What is a mountain in your life? I've got one that I want to get rid of so bad, but I don't see any way around it. And I'm asking him to move that mountain. Faith of a grain of a mustard seed, because he can move the mountain. This one, I've got a deep longing. I've had it for a long time. And a longing isn't, James said we've, we don't receive if we ask selfishly. A longing to me is if he fulfills this, it will bring him glory. I want to bring him glory with this. Pray for that. And end with this little thing. This is from the book of Malachi. God says, test me and see. One of the reasons I think we don't test them is because we're like Zechariah. We think too highly of ourselves and our ability to rational through it. I'm old. Ah, you're not going to answer me. Jared and praise team, if you can come, let's just close in prayer, and they're going to close us with a song. Father, right now, I am, before congregation going to lift up these two things. I've got a mountain that God please remove. I can't. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Please do it. On the other side, God, there's a dream I have. and I'd love for it to be fulfilled so that you would be glorified more in my life. Lord, I know everybody in here has those two things. We send them to you. We leave them at your feet. And we trust you in Christ's name.